this was not my crime. You know, I, I didn't do this. I hate pedophilia. And I mean it, I hate pedophilia. We didn't cover it up. We did tell people straight away. We did make, take his credential off him. He never did preach again. And uh, we did oversee and ensure that he was never put in a position to be close to kids to be able to do that again. What we didn't do is report it to the police. What we didn't do is report it to the police. That was Brian Houston, co-founder and global senior pastor at Hillsong Church. Brian is facing charges by New South Wales police for failing to report pedophilia. The church has also been the subject of multiple reports of sexual abuse. Hillsong pastors have shared problematic views on homosexuality, abortion and vaccines, yet they still have friends in parliament who give them preferential treatment. And that's why today, the Hillsong Church is on Vulture Watch. On an average week, 150,000 people attend Hillsong in over 30 countries. Award-winning bands, massive conferences with celebrity guests, ministry colleges, a TV channel that broadcasts into 183 countries. Everything about this church is big, bright and boisterous. Part of their marketing strategy is their use of celebrities like Chris Pratt. Here he is crediting his pastor for helping him lose weight. I just came off it a couple days ago. It's a 21 day fast. I did it through my church. It's based on Daniel. Uh, the yeah, book of Daniel? The book of Daniel. The prophet? The prophet Daniel, Daniel from the book of, yeah, from the Old Testament, the book of Daniel. I was inspired by my pastor. We do it, it's kind of like our Lent, you know, give something up. There's this great quote that I actually heard in church and it felt like a really appropriate, which was, if the spotlight that's shining on you is brighter than the light that, that comes from within you, it'll kill you. And you see it all the time. Wow. Following that interview, Ellen Page, also an actor, took to Twitter and rightly called out an important issue that wasn't addressed. But his church is infamously anti-LGBTQ, so maybe address that too? And Pratt hit right back with a well-scripted message on his Instagram story. It has recently been suggested that I belong to a church which hates a certain group of people and is infamously anti-LGBTQ. Nothing could be further from the truth. I go to a church that opens their doors to absolutely everyone. Despite what the Bible says about divorce, my church community was there for me every step of the way, never judging, just gracefully accompanying me on my walk. They helped me tremendously offering love and support. It is what I have seen them do for others on countless occasions, regardless of sexual orientation, race or gender. Well, what Chris has allegedly seen doesn't quite align with what Hillsong actually believes. Brian Houston, for example, fired a Hillsong choir director after learning that he is gay. Brian's explanation was, we do not affirm a gay lifestyle and because of this, we do not knowingly have actively gay people in positions of leadership. So when Chris proudly claims that doors are open for everyone, he's clearly wrong. But I wonder how many of his 34 million Instagram followers actually realise this. And while celebrities can add brand value and bring young people to the church, the real point of attraction, what keeps them there at Hillsong, has to be their concert-style church gatherings. Come on, Jesus is about to come and fill us once again. The worship at Hillsong is unparalleled. We can together. Have you ever been told that you're, you're part of a cult? <laughs> yep. The music's amazing. The number of Australians who call themselves Christian is falling and fast. There are almost a million fewer Christians than there were just five years ago. But there is one Christian denomination that's bucking that trend. Let's put our hands together. Pentecostal churches like Hillsong are on the rise. Membership has grown by 18% in the past decade. And almost half of those are under the age of 30. That's right, and it makes sense. Young people who hate boring old church but still somehow love Jesus are a huge target market. And for many of these people, it is just the right church at the right time. Or at least financially speaking for Hillsong, it is a perfect business opportunity. You know, it's a big church and we've got big needs and big bills and uh, really I make no apology for it. Serious questions are now being asked about what Hillsong is spending all that money on and why it's allowed to get away without paying any tax. Some sections of the Australian media, they're juvenile. They just need to grow up. I think they've got an obsession with money. The real story, the real story, it, it doesn't get told. And that's a frustration. The work that we've done overseas, working with people like World Vision and Vision Rescue, helping street kids in Mumbai, and drug addiction, uh, rehabilitation, so many things. They're not interested in that story. 
Oh, come on, of course we're interested. We're especially interested in how much money raised from congregants actually ends up going to these amazing causes Brian has mentioned here. Surely that's not too much to ask. There is something within that Australian mentality that when something starts to do well, then everyone wants to question why. Okay, that's not just an Australian mentality, it's called accountability. Just this year, Hillsong received over $900,000 from government grants. So of course, taxpayers will ask questions about your financials. I think the fact that in 2015, a church in Australia is blessed, God's blessing, it's growing, it's got momentum, it's got movement. Man, it makes some people out there so angry. Well, that whole subject of Hillsong and money is like a little bit of a broken record for a lot of people because it's, you know, so inaccurate on so many levels. And I think the general Australian public, with any degree of intelligence, know that it's just rubbish. Hmm. Perhaps she's right. Maybe I'm an unintelligent general Australian just having a winch. So let's look at where Hillsong have actually spent their tax-free money. Now, the only year in which Hillsong were required to show their detailed financials to the Australian Charities and Not-for-Profit Commission was back in 2017. Note here, this is just the revenue generated in Australia of around $75 million. They spent a whopping $3,420 of that money on grants and donations in this country. Sure, they spent $1.6 million overseas, but even then, the total is only about 2% of their total gross income. This, while they push their own volunteers and members to pay 10% of their income as tithing to the church. Yeah, but that was 2017. What about the years after that? Well, thanks to a change in federal law, Hillsong Church Australia are since classified as a basic religious charity and no longer have to produce such detailed financial information to the commission. But they do produce annual reports. So we can go to their 2018 report and see that they gave 11% under the global and local benevolent category. How they define this category or the actual breakdown have not been provided. In 2019, you'll notice they've combined benevolent programs with church planting and missions, and they've only spent a grand total of 6% in that year. Looking at 2020, there's no mention of benevolence at all. Missions are now combined with outreach, totaling a mere 7%. Now, I get it. It's not Hillsong's fault that archaic laws around the world just allow big religious organizations to pay virtually no tax and have close to zero accountability. The system needs fixing, totally agreed, but if you're going to market yourself as the beacon of morality and righteousness and contribute as little as you do to charity yet you call yourself a basic religious charity to avoid having to publicly share your financials, then the general Australian public, um, how do I put it? The general Australian public, with any degree of intelligence, know that it's just rubbish. Could not have said it better myself. Speaking of rubbish, let's now wade into more murkier waters. And this is where I must issue a trigger warning as we will now cover themes like assault, rape, and pedophilia. What you're about to watch can be distressing. Back in 1999, Brian Houston, who was then the head of a Pentecostal movement called Assemblies of God, learnt about child rape allegations against one of his most trusted pastors. The predator was his own father, Frank Houston. The high profile pastor who used his position of power to sexually abuse young boys. Confess your sin to the Lord and he'll blot it out. During his visits to Australia, he would stay with the Senstocks and night after night, he would sneak into seven-year-old Brett's bedroom to sexually abuse him. I could not speak, I couldn't scream, I couldn't push back, I just went rigid and I couldn't breathe. I was petrified. And it did not stop there. Frank continued to abuse Brett till he was 12, and when Brett turned 16, he finally told his mother about it. According to this report, despite learning about this, Brett's mother chose to protect the church instead of reporting it. 20 years later, in 1999, she finally reported it, not to the police, but to the church. And this is when Brian Houston claims to have heard about it first. Now, whether Brian and other senior executives had a legal obligation to report these allegations to the police was the subject of a police investigation. But in any case, they chose not to go to the police. When Brett Senstock revealed his story to the Royal Commission on Child Sex Abuse, Brian Houston found himself in the witness box. At that stage, you certainly knew that there were that very serious allegations had been made against your father. Yes, I did. And that the allegations were likely to be criminal conduct of one Yes, I did. I didn't have any doubt that it was criminal conduct. Right. 
But Brian Houston took the view that it was up to Brett to report his abuser to the police. Rightly or wrongly, I genuinely believed that uh, I would be preempting the, the uh, victim if I were to just call the police uh, at that point. What the church did do was strip Frank Houston of his credentials, and he retired on a pension. But they never revealed the awful truth of Frank's crimes. Rightly or wrongly? For a man who claims to preach the morals of God to still be in denial about whether it was right or not to report pedophilia to the police is absolutely staggering. When Pastor Bob Cotton, who is also part of the Pentecostal movement, heard of these allegations for the first time in 2014, the respect he had for his then hero and role model Frank Houston immediately turned into shame and disgust. Our executive knew what Frank had done, yet did nothing to protect the innocent and did everything to protect the, the assets and cash of the institution and the reputation of Frank Houston. That could have been my child. That could have been my son. That could have been the child of somebody in my church. And if they won't apologise to Brett, I'll apologise to him. Because I'm part of the organisation that did this to him. And what's been done is wrong, and I'm so sorry for what's happened to that man. And Bob wasn't just sorry. He was determined to deliver justice. He collated many confidential documents that clearly showed that once the higher authorities at the Assemblies of God became aware of more cases of Frank's pedophilia, they actively tried to suppress the information from getting out. 2001. The first Bob Cotton knew of any kind of problem was when he received this confidential letter from the Assemblies of God revealing that Frank had been stood down. By now, the church hierarchy had known of Frank's pedophilia for two years what they described in the letter as a serious moral failure. We're talking about child rape. We're talking about child rape. It's a crime, not a serious moral failure. This is a criminal act. A single act of sexual abuse more than 30 years ago. November 2000, Brian Houston becomes aware of more victims. A total of six specific allegations have been investigated. December 2000, the church goes into damage control. Statement concerning Frank Houston. It will only be used publicly if rumours become so extensive. December 2001, pastors learn of Frank's serious moral failure and are urged to keep quiet. We cannot see any reason for this to be announced to your church or further afield. I can't see how they could escape the fact that they had a serial child sex offender. They knew that there was more than one victim. They knew this was going to be a PR disaster. I, I see it purely as an act of, of self-protection. Self-preservation. Self-preservation. Exactly. To still call them rumours, a whole year after Brett Sangstock's issue was raised, is telling of the priorities of the church. And while Brett was not able to prove to the court that the Assemblies of God was responsible for his abuse, he certainly did a lot to inspire other victims of Frank Houston to come forward, and implored politicians like David Shoebridge to raise the matter in the New South Wales State Parliament. The Royal Commission found that Brian Houston's response repeatedly failed the victim. He failed to report the matter to police, and he failed to deal with his own conflict of interest while leading the church. The findings provide a strong basis for prosecution under Section 316 of the Crimes Act for the failure to disclose. I know that the defence put forward was that Brett didn't want anyone to know. Is that a defence? The fact that one child or one survivor doesn't want you to tell police does not answer your obligations. Because the obligation of going to the police is to ensure that perpetrators are held to account and they don't abuse others. It's not just a failure to deliver justice for Brett but it's a failure to provide the protective measures for others in their care. He's right. Justice isn't just about reparation, it's about ensuring it doesn't happen again. While these hearings were happening, a number of recent abuse victims from within Hillsong came forward with their stories, raising questions on whether the culture which enabled Frank Houston's abuse all those years ago is still prevalent today. Feeling extremely uncomfortable, Anna decided to leave. But then, Jason groped her. 
So he was still sitting and I was standing next to him getting ready to walk out and he grabbed me and put his hands like all around my waist in between my legs touching my crotch and my butt and he lifted up my shirt and was kissing my stomach like don't go and then I was trying to pull away from him and then I did get away and um, he was stumbling out the door trying to follow us. I think it's evident where he was heading and what he was thinking. Jason Mays was eventually charged with indecent assault and pleaded guilty when the case came before the court here in Penrith. According to a statement from Hillsong, Jason Mays was given a second chance because despite his guilty plea, some other people did not fully corroborate Anna's version of events. They further said, one of the cornerstones of our biblical beliefs as Christians is forgiveness and redemption. It is important Jason is allowed this as well. Yes, you heard right. Despite pleading guilty in court, assaulter Jason Mays gets a second chance from Hillsong because as Christians, they believe in forgiveness. And here's what Brian Houston had to say about this particular assault. One thing I do know is we're not talking about a sexual predator here. We're talking about a young man, young married man, who did something stupid, got much drunker than he should, which is an issue we've got to keep addressing and got himself in a bad situation. That's it. There you go. If you're a young, married, drunk man and you're not a predator, then you're allowed to assault any woman with zero consequences as far as Brian is concerned. Culture starts at the top and there are many cases like Jason Mays and they all point to a culture problem within Hillsong. But instead of owning up and fixing these issues, Hillsong seems to be obsessed with polishing up their image and continuing to sell the Hillsong brand. And when you need image cleaning and brand selling, you need two friends in your corner, the media and politicians. Shortly after the Royal Commission hearings, Studio 10 invited Brian Houston over to plug his new book, Live, Love, Lead. Let's have a look at how they introduce him and pay particular attention to how brief and dismissive they are about this tiny little scandal. It all started in a small warehouse over 30 years ago by a pastor's son. Now Hillsong has hundreds and thousands of followers from more than 60 countries worldwide. We just thank you for all the promise that Jesus is alive. But with an annual revenue of over $60 million, the church has an escaped scandal. Questions over sizable donations extracted from parishioners and child sex claims against the founder's father. I knew he would never preach again from that moment. But none of that has slowed Hillsong's rapid growth. Creators of this Pentecostal church, Brian and Bobby Houston, say it's all part of life in the faith lane. And the best is yet to come. It's bringing the power and the promise of an almighty God into your life. Oh, if you believe it, say amen. Please give a big Studio 10 welcome to the one and only Brian Houston from Hillsong. Wow, even Brian seems embarrassed by that intro. In that 70 second intro, they spend less than seven seconds on the child abuse scandal. And even in those seconds, they refer to them as just claims. No, they're not just claims. Frank Houston admitted on record to pedophilia, and more importantly, Brian Houston chose not to report it to the police. And the only part of that witness statement they used was, I knew he would never preach from that moment. Not the part where he says he rightly or wrongly did not report it to the police. If that intro doesn't tell you the purpose of this segment, just take a look at these hard hitting questions Brian is asked. It's like a Beyonce concert, it's huge. <laughs> what is it about Hillsong that draws so many young followers? What made you decide to set up an, another church given that you were raised by a pastor yourself? You've written this book, Live, Love and Lead. You've got it all in there, the good and the bad. Mm. Hillsong has done a whole lot of good. What are you most proud of? What do you sort of think this is the difference we are making to our community. <laughs> Some critics of Hillsong have said the money making behind it and the fact that um, parishioners have to contribute, is it 10% of their earnings to the church, that some people are concerned about that. Is, is that how it works within the church? All through the book, the message seems to be the best is yet to be. It doesn't matter where you're at. It doesn't matter if you've had a raw deal, if you're right up there. I took from that that you're very optimistic about the future. Is that the key of Hillsong? That the future is bright, if you believe. Hmm, riveting stuff. To be fair, the issue does come up, but only in the most cringeworthy manner possible. 
and I, I never lost that passion to this day. I've still got that same passion. And I think that's been what helps you to get up every time you get knocked down. Yes, well, your father got knocked down in a sense, didn't he? Is that what inspired, is that what really made you take that final step to set up your own church? Well, you mean his sexual abuse? Yes. Yeah, so yeah, well, I was 45 when I found yeah. those things out, yeah. so I was one and truly building our church by then. Okay, Frank Houston did not get knocked down. What a disgraceful attempt at painting a pedophile as a victim. And she doesn't stop there. Given, given the number of child abuse, the abuse cases that we've got in Australia yeah. at the moment, the great, and the Royal Commission going on, did your father's, did your father's um, uh, behaviour actually uh, make you question your own faith for a while there? Okay, more misdirection and implied water battery. What do other child abuse cases in Australia have to do with Brian's faith or his church? And why do we need to sugarcoat pedophilia as behaviour? Child rape is not behaviour, it's a crime. And instead of asking about the real victims, she's oh so concerned about Brian's faith and how he was affected. Here's more pitiful attempts at trying to paint Brian as a real victim here. Could I ask a question? Have yeah. you forgiven him? I mean, part of your faith is about forgiveness, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, you're not alone. I mean, it, you, yeah. there's, there's all of this surrounding the, the Catholic Church as well. Yeah. I think it's important for children to have faith. I think it's important for all of us to have faith in something or someone. Yeah. Um, but it, it interests me because it must have been shattering for you. That's right. Apparently, Brian is not alone. It's surrounding the Catholic Church as well. So more water battery, misdirection, and toning down of real crime. And apparently children need faith. What an obnoxious thing to say given the context. And that's not even the worst of what Jamie Dury had to say. Despite the obvious pretext of pedophilia and ongoing sexual abuse in the church, Jamie chose to say these words. But all the, all the children you're working with now and, the, and, yeah. and, and all of the followers must give you a lot of strength and a lot of satisfaction. Yeah. Studio 10 not only aired this segment, but also has to have it on their YouTube channel for everyone to see. And it's not just Channel 10. There are a number of media houses around the globe that have been so charitable to Brian and Hillsong and have not held him or the church accountable for their failings. And Brian doesn't just have friends in the media, but also in the parliament. Pretty high up, actually. I made a commitment to my faith in an early age and have been greatly assisted by the pastoral work of many dedicated church leaders, in particular the Reverend Ray Green and pastors Brian Houston and Lee Coleman. That was Scott Morrison delivering his first speech in Parliament in which Brian Houston got a special mention. Morrison is not officially a member of Hillsong, but he is a member of Horizon, which is also a Pentecostal movement. Here he is as Prime Minister speaking at the annual Hillsong conference back in 2019. Hey, what do you feel about the place of the church in Australia now with so much social change? It's difficult, but I'm not a pastor. I'm a Prime Minister. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not talking about... Our freedoms as Christians in this country, and they should be protected. Australia is a free country, and there's nothing more fundamental than the freedom of belief, whatever that belief might be. Whether you have one or you don't. It might be of a different religion, it might be a different faith, but the freedom to believe is so important. And uh, that needs to be nourished, and it needs to be protected. But uh, what this country needs more than that is, is the love of God. I'm going to ask you about freedom of religion, and would that be able to you know, your policy or anything, but do you believe that it will be secure for uh, the churches to feel safe in terms of their beliefs? And, uh... Yeah, I do. I, I do. And, and this is one of the things that I feel passionately about since I first went into Parliament 12 years ago. We talked about it in the first speech I ever gave. And yeah, of course, we'll do what we must do from a legislative point of view in the law. I speak about my faith with Jenny because I want everyone in this place to feel comfortable about talking their faith in this country. It's, it's not a political agenda, it's just who we are, it's who you are. Okay, let's unpack that a bit. Firstly, it's okay for Scott Morrison to have his own faith. That's his personal life. But he cannot go on stage, refer to himself as the Prime Minister, and then say it's not a political agenda. Particularly when Brian asks him if churches will feel safe in terms of beliefs, he cannot promise to amend legislation or the law which is exactly what he did. Here he is again at the Australian Churches Conference in April this year, where Brian is mentioned again, along with Bobby Houston. Hillsong, and of course to you, Brian, and, and Bobby, just pay your honour, mate, and to Bobby as well. Yes, the Prime Minister paying honour to a man who at this point was publicly being investigated by police for failing to report pedophilia. It is utterly disgraceful. 
Now, let's go back a bit to 2019, when police began their investigation. At that time, Scott Morrison was preparing for his first state visit as Prime Minister to the White House, which included an exclusive dinner at the Rose Garden. A Washington Post reporter, Vivian Salama, found out through a source that Morrison had insisted Brian be included in the dinner guest list. When the media asked him about this, this is what he had to say. I don't comment on gossip, honestly. That's not true. It's all gossip. Yeah. Did you actually put a request in for him to, I don't to comment come? on gossip of stories about other stories? Does that mean it's not true, though? It means it's gossip. What but about not true? It means it's gossip. But not true? I think oh, I've yeah. answered the question. Uh, no, he clearly hadn't answered the question. But six months later, in a radio interview, this happened. On that occasion, we put forward a number of names. I mean, that included Brian. Uh, but uh, not, not everybody whose names were put forward were invited. Ah, so it wasn't gossip. Now, the issue isn't that Morrison wanted his mate to join him for dinner. The issue is that for a state visit, he put forward the name of a man who was being investigated by police in a serious criminal matter. And he lied to the Australian public. But the real problem arises when people like Brian Houston leverage their political friendships to influence policies to their advantage to get preferential treatment. In July this year, as the Delta variant began raging across Sydney, Brian Houston complained on his Facebook page about the New South Wales government's ban on singing in church. Let's make a stand, he wrote. 7.30 can reveal that one of the people who responded to this call to action was New South Wales Liberal MP Tanya Davis. Hi, Pastor Brian. I raised this issue with Gladys and Brad this morning, and Brad has just issued an exemption to permit two singers in Greater Sydney. I sent details to Donna. Please get the word out to as many pastors today as they prepare for tomorrow. Kind regards, Tanya Davies, MP, member for Mulgoa. The following day, Health Minister Brad Hazard partially lifted the restriction on singing in places of worship to allow up to two singers with some safeguards. Member of Parliament Tanya Davis confirmed in a statement that she did approach the minister about this exemption. So all it took was a Facebook post from Brian Houston and a Member of Parliament, no less, same party as Morrison, makes a public comment on that post assuring Brian that they'll make a change and then goes ahead and implements it, risking actual lives in the middle of a pandemic. And that's not even the full extent of this issue. These relationships between church and state influence long-term policymaking as well. Remember when Morrison promised his friend on stage that we will do what we must do? That was not an empty promise. Morrison introduced the Religious Discrimination Bill into Parliament in November this year, and it has rightly received significant backlash. Professor George Williams, an expert on Australian law, said that the bill is inconsistent with international human rights, and the Australian Lawyers Alliance also warns it could be unconstitutional. If legislated in its current form, the bill will provide immunity for people to freely express their religious views. For example, according to this report, a doctor can tell a patient that their disability is a punishment for their sin. An employee can tell a colleague that they will go to hell for their sexuality. A Catholic hospital could choose to hire only Catholic doctors who are anti-abortion. Religious schools, outfits like Hillsong Church, could literally fire anyone for being gay. So this religious discrimination bill is being sold as freedom for the religious, but ironically, it's actually freedom to discriminate without consequence. As prominent Victorian MP Fiona Patton rightly puts it, this bill is a license for bigotry. Before we get to the final words, it must be acknowledged that we addressed many serious issues in this video. If you're affected by this content and need to talk to someone, please do reach out to a mental health professional. In Australia, you can contact Beyond Blue. I'll leave a link in the description. Let's address this bill first. It is undeniable that religion is of deep significance for many Australians. To be fair, many issues raised in this video don't just apply to Hillsong or Christianity or even just Australia. There are thousands of religious organisations all around the world spreading toxic cultural values, regressive ideologies and bigotry of all sorts. But their demands seem to be similar. They all want special treatment just because they're religious. They don't want to pay tax. They want public funding. They want to be exempt from the rules that apply to the rest of society, like choosing to hire and fire based on sexuality, sharing intolerant views and abortions, or spreading misinformation on vaccines. All of this needs to stop simply for the fact that there are real life costs associated to all these special privileges. If anything, we need a bill that holds these organisations more accountable and provides children, women and other minorities more protection from exploitation and abuse. We do not need a bill that further legitimises such victimisation. Now coming to Hillsong. 
There are undoubtedly many hardworking, honest and charitable people within Hillsong. Otherwise, the church wouldn't be as big as it is. The purpose of this video is not to mock or troll such people. It is to help them realise that their well-intentioned generosity may not be used in ways that they would hope. It is also to implore them to hold their church and its leaders accountable for their many failings. This video is also about understanding what it takes for a mother to not report the rape of her own child for 20 years. It is about realising what kind of system leads to victims like Brett Sandstock being abandoned while pedophiles like Frank Houston can retire on a pension. It is about the indecency of a TV channel in painting even a pedophile as a victim. It is about the shocking failure of a Prime Minister in representing a secular democracy. It is also about people like Bob Cotton who bravely fight for justice. It is about people like David Shoebridge who rightly question injustice. It is about journalists like Liz Hayes who are not afraid to ask the tough questions. It is about the triumph of a judicial process that uncovers a crime from decades ago and brings it to the fore. As humanity progresses to a better tomorrow, it becomes critical for us all to at least recognise what is contributing to such progress and what is holding us back. Thank you for watching. Vulture Watch.